Hey everybody, uh, that was very nice. Thanks, Professor Rockford. Um, this is a big honor to come here, and thanks for those people that came out to, to see uh, see me fill up those first couple of rows. I'm very very happy. Um, I'm going to be leaning forward here because I I need to see the screen. I got some things I want to speak about. I didn't. I don't want to be a, uh, like a monitor here, so I may flash at the uh, bad angle of me. But anyway, the reason why I'm here uh, is to give you just a little insight into uh, what it is to be an artist, your journey, um, to kind of talk about how it was as a young kid trying to um, to be an artist. I, I'm sure, how many students are out here? All right, everybody's a student, me too. Um, when I was younger, I always wanted to be an artist. My mom was an artist, so she put me in art school my whole life. And uh, my father, who was from Brooklyn, you know, that was kind of a tough thing. His son was to be a painter, you know. Um, anyway, so when I was younger, I, I didn't really think it was a real job. I didn't think that people could do that for a living. I thought it was something that only a few people could do, lucky people, um, a few chosen people. Well, uh, things changed in my life. I'm going to go over that with you. Let me go forward here and tell you a little bit about this presentation. First thing is the int introduction, the uh, influence and inspiration I'll talk about, my process, um, art as a career, and the conclusion a little Q&A if you have more questions for me. All right. First thing I want to do before I, I start in my introduction of my life story and bore you to tears, I want to give you a little um, idea of what I do as a painter. I'm an oil painter. Um, I like to figure, I like to do overlays of images, I like to use animals, I love the symbolism that's in, inherent in those uh, relationships. I'll just run through real quick, get an idea. I do portraits and figures. Some of them are classically themed, some of them are not. Like the, those three little kids, it's just my one boy. I kind of rolled them over on the floor, took pictures and painted it. Do some paintings of people I know. All portraits, this one. And here I am, this is my first award. This is a nice award because it was also my last award, which is one part of my story. I never won an art award since then. This is fourth grade. And I was very proud. I were first place in Queens, New York. And there I am, on top of me is the uh, pastel drawing of my panther that I proudly uh, showed everybody. And I got my Tom right here. I'll buckle, uh, just in case I forgot my name. Anyway, I am a professor at Broward College, like Professor Rockford said, and also at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. I teach painting and Photoshop and Flash and drawing and art history now and sculpture. Um, so really, I embrace all technologies from art making. Um, I, again, like Professor Rockford said, I went to St. John's University in New York. Uh, if anybody knows of St. John's, uh, it's really known for a basketball team. So my art department was quite small. I was probably one of two painters there, and um, I wasn't really the best student either, which is another thing I like to tell my students. Um, you don't have to be the best, but you have to work hard. And that's what I did. I had one student that came in. Everybody loved her. Whatever she did, the teachers loved. I tried hard, and we liked it. But I outworked her. And, uh, you know, it just shows in the end. So if you can outwork people, you just keep on going, plowing through. I'm from Ozone Park, Queens, New York. I don't know if you guys know of Ozone Park. It's predominantly, it was predominantly an Italian neighborhood, really tough Italian neighborhood. It's known for the mafia, uh, a lot of mafia in that neighborhood. So I didn't really tell a lot of people I was an artist, because you couldn't tell Giuseppe, I'm gonna go home and paint some flowers, and I'll get my butt kicked. Um, but it's also a town named after pollution and ozone. Who would ever move to a place saying ozone, right? Ozone park. And there was no parks there. It was kind of odd. It was a very weird place to live. I was very eager to get out of there. Um, in 1993, I did. I got fed up 
and moved south. I got a U-Haul truck, never been to South Beach. Was, I heard um, some people were moving there, like um, Kenny Scharf, who was opening up the Scharf shop, and I went all the way. And I said, oh, this is, I gotta get out of New York and headed south. And in 1996, I opened up my company to be the studio doing graphics and illustrations and murals. All right, I cannot read it there, but I'm sure you can. All right, here I am at the Met as a kid. I went to a Catholic school, which is perfectly fine. 17 years of Catholic school, and I'm normal. A little twitch once in a while. And here I am right here checking out the, um, the painting here in Goya. Because, you know, when I was younger, it was something about art that it was, it was like a, an attraction. I would, no matter where I was, my mom would, didn't have any money to take me to the city. Because New York was a city. We lived in Queens. And uh, so when I could get to go, it was like something... Just a magical. I mean, there were movies and TV, and that's magical. But to actually go to and see these wonderful paintings and, and how they did it, I love the magic of art. I just, I think, I think that's one thing that we miss out on in, in the computer world. You know, that we don't, you can transform a material into into feeling. It's, to me, it's very beautiful. This painting here by Tiepolo, I call it Tiepolo's foot because when I was a kid, isn't at the foot of the steps at the Met. As you get up to the top, all you can see is the foot. And I thought, what a grand painting that is. I want to make paintings that big, if I ever could. I want to make huge paintings um, that were, were classical and, and just majestic like that. And this is uh, last September. I went to the Met and got a chance to uh, go back and see that Tiepolo's foot once again. All right, I'm going to move this way. see. I have little notes here. I didn't think I would have printed them out if I didn't know I was going to see. But anyway, when I went to college, I was a graphic design major. Again, because that was what I was told to do. That was a real job. So I went for graphic design, and my grades were not that great. I had a painting class, and I tell this in front of all my students, every class, I preface the class with this story. I had a painting class, and the teacher said, Davida, you're going to fail. I said, oh my God, I can't fail. I can't fail painting. How can I fail painting? My mom put me in art school my whole life. So I wrangled up some paint and borrowed. I didn't have any of So I borrowed from friends. And I did a, a quick impasto painting and I handed it to the teacher. I get goosebumps every time. And the teacher looked at me and goes, you're going to be a painter. And that was it. That's all I needed to do. That one, that click, that light bulb that went off. And, um, I went downstairs so that I changed my major to fine art. I didn't tell anybody, I didn't tell my dad. Just, of course, they wouldn't agree to that. And uh, of course, my grades went straight to A's. And I never looked back. Uh, but I, I always wanted to be that teacher once. Maybe once I could do that. Again, coming from a tough neighborhood, again, you couldn't tell Vito, hey, Vito, you know, you gotta go paint, you hang out. I had to change my, my whole support system. I had to surround myself with people of like-minded interest in art. Because not many people understand what we do. It's a luxury. It's, it doesn't really have a function that people understand. So I really wanted to have a coterie of friends that, um, that would help me and inspire me and support me. And I think it's very important that you guys start doing that for yourselves. Uh, make sure that you, you're surrounded by people who understand what you do because it is not accessible to everybody. And it's, it's, it should be, but it's not. People just don't understand it. My, my first real big show was at the National Art Gallery in Gramsci Park, which is kind of the lead thing, if you guys don't know about it. Um, I had a huge painting of my girlfriend. It was as big as you can imagine because I thought big was good. In New York, all the paintings are big, and I did this big painting. And um, it was my first taste of, of feeling, exhibiting my work and feeling that people uh, could, could uh, feel what I feel or be inspired by me. And it was, a nice, it was a nice move because that just got the ball rolling. And that's what you have to do for yourselves, exhibit your work all the time. When I first started painting, one of the artists that I thought I should follow was Chuck Close. Uh, Chuck Close. Um, you guys know Chuck Close, does these really big heads, uh, changed portraiture, and um, I think that uh, I thought, well, if I could do portraiture, if I could do figures, if I could do everything else. Well, I was wrong. Yeah, that's not the truth. 
But uh, I thought that was the hardest thing to do, so I'm going to start at the top, and then everything else should be easy. So that was my, my inspiration. I went to a gallery, a professor, and if you guys know Chuck Close, he's, he's um, handicapped now. He had a spinal a stroke. And uh, when I saw him, my teacher's like, hey, Davida, there's your friend, there's Chuck Close. Oh, you know, and I was like running. I ran up to Chuck Close, and I went to go shake his hand, and you know, he's handicapped. And my teacher was like, what an idiot. But he couldn't lift his hands at the time. He was quite uh, new and was, was injured. Um, so what I did was, and I tell all the students I can in every class, is to be an artist, you need to immerse yourself in art. You cannot be a part-time artist. You can't do it on the weekends. You have to go to all the exhibits, and you need to immerse yourself in the scene. I was working in the labor's union on a jackhammer in New York City, and then going to New York, uh, Queens for school, and I would go to the galleries filled with dirt and mud. I did not care, because in New York, they don't even talk to you anyway. So when you go into a gallery, they're very, very, so I didn't care. I just wanted to make sure I saw all the art I could. So if you really want to be an artist, that's something you want to get into. Is, is try to go to all the art scenes as you can, all the exhibits. Upon my graduation, right before my graduation, I had an internship with, uh, and they wanted to put me in some silly internship. And I said, no, I'm going to go find, I want to find an artist to work for, a gallery. I found this gentleman, Dan Christensen, who is a minimalist, lyrical abstractionist painter. And he had a beautiful studio in Waverly Place, 16 Waverly Place, right off Washington Square Park. And um, I was his assistant for a long time. And it was great. It was a great experience. One, I saw what a real artist looks like and does for a living. He wakes up at 11 and, you know, goes out all night long and took me to bars in New York City in the village. And I got to meet a lot of artists there. Um, it was a great education. I'm going to show you his work. But these are just little things I'm going to show you. Um, and that was Kenny Sharp Shop Shop on Espanola. And that was what I uh, drove me down to Miami. All right, one of the things that a lot of students ask is, I, I want to get inspired, I don't, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to paint. You know, I think Ari was one saying that yesterday. No, I'm joking. Um, but, it, you know, if you, you, well, here's two quotes. One of them's from Chuck Close, Inspirations for Amateurs. The rest of us just get to work. That's a great quote. It's great for Chuck Close. He does one painting in nine months. You know, after nine months, you should know what you're doing next, right? But if you're doing a painting a week or a painting every two weeks, it's kind of hard to keep the momentum going. Um, the one I prescribe to more is inspiration exists, but it has to find you working by Picasso. I think that's true. Just work, and you find the inspiration eventually. So here's Dan Christensen's work. You can't get more farther away from my type of painting. And when I worked with Danny, he used to make fun of me, because all his friends were, you know, leftover minimalists and lyrical abstractions, um, all from coming from the Greenberg School, if you guys know Clement Greenberg. Um, so I would come with my little paintings, and he would be like, oh man, go back in your time machine and get out of here, you know, this is old stuff, this is the new stuff here. Um, the painting on your uh, left, just to give you an idea, is, was $100,000 in the gallery, so you can imagine, this, Christensen was, was pretty well known. Um, and the painting here on the right, I got the, uh, I was lucky enough to name it. That was as good as I got the making process. I put, I made sure it was La Bella Vita, so I got my name in there a little bit. Um, but he worked in spray painting, he would spray. He was, and then he had a huge warehouse. It was a hat factory in a place. Huge. And the door, he had a door that was attached with lead, so when a fire would slide, that was the old fire door. It would just slide closed. Um, but really, I was enamored by his existence. I mean, they, he, was, he was the true essence of the artist. And I kept on telling myself, if he can do it, I can do it. That's what I always told myself. Why can't, why, if he can do it, why can't I do it? Uh, and that's what always drove me. Here's Dan Kirchison here. These are the, the painting next to him is uh, one of my favorites. It's very, very big. And the, the gray area is shiny. It has a reflective coating on it. And then the purple area is very flat, so it's not just colors that are changing, it's not saturation alone, but it's also this interplay with light. Only the viewer can see from the angle that they're at, so it's kind of nice. Um, the movement that he's coming out of is minimalism, which is very, I don't know if you guys know minimalism, it's very plain, it's almost the aesthetic of boredom. And uh, he's coming out more sensuous lines, more freeing, more expressive. So it's, um, it's all coming out of the Greenberg School. 
One of the greatest things about meeting Dan, um, aside from cleaning his acrylic paintings with Wonder Bread, because that's, you can't spray it, so you have to clean the painting with Wonder Bread to get the dust up, which is kind of interesting. But one day he said, you gotta come to the studio early, because I have a special treat for you. So, <coughs> excuse me. So I came to the studio, and most of the time when he had me come, I was either pouring champagne for someone to buy, you know, or cleaning up, or stretching and stuff. But this time there was this old gentleman in the middle of his studio with glasses and a scotch, unfiltered camel, and he was just sitting there and I would bring the paintings over. And every time I brought the paintings over, he would, he would close his eyes so he wouldn't see the painting. And he would open his eyes and he'd go, purple's too strong. Well, this guy was Clement Greenberg. I don't know if anybody here would know about Clement Greenberg. Hopefully in our history they touched on it. Clement Greenberg was the proponent of abstract expressionism. He, he, he pioneered it, he pushed Pollock. If you ever watched the Pollock movie, he's a, one of the actors in the movie, uh, one of the characters in the movie. Anyway, to, to see Clement Greenberg at work was amazing. And again, totally opposite the type of work that I liked. But of course, I read all his essays and I wanted to be smart in the art world. Yeah. But um, one of the questions I had for Clement Greenberg was like, why do you close your eyes? And he says, I want instant retinal impact. I want I don't want to decide on how I feel about the painting as it's moving. I want to have that instant retinal impact on the, on the work. And it really had a uh, profound impact on me because I thought, you know, the impact of color and how does color affect emotion. I thought that was really cool. I could put that in my painting. And a lot of my paintings got a little bit more colorful after that. I just, um, I just like the impact of red, how red makes people feel, and dark colors, and how we can play with the temperature of color. So it was really great education. Most of my education was uh, after graduation. Here's Clement Greenberg. <clears throat> One of his uh, great quotes, openness to not only in painting is the quality and the most exhilarating, the attuned eyes of our time. Um, a lot of these paintings from the color field painters are, are big, so they're in your peripheral vision when you look at them. You don't see the wall and you don't feel control of them. You kind of, it's called the sublime, you know, the vision of seeing big. So I, in the beginning of my early career, I used to make huge paintings. They're all in storage now because they don't fit anywhere. You know? But at the time, I wanted to be a real painter. And Dan Christensen died a couple years back. This was sad. He, um, he was a good guy. All right. I swore I'll get to the boring part. So, when I headed to South Beach, everybody was kind of, you know, there's nothing there. I, I don't know if you guys know about Miami Beach, but in 1993, you could take a rock and throw it from Alta Road to Collins and hit nobody. Maybe an old person, but no, really nobody was there. So I really thought I made a mistake. But one of the good things that happened to me was there, there was uh, no, really no artist there. And a lot of the French from Saint-Tropez had moved there to build restaurants. So they started, you know, hiring me often. Uh, my dad, again, was like, what are you going to do? Are you going to get a job in the paper? Right? So I went, lucky me, the, this guy puts an ad in the paper so that I get a job painting. I was, it was the best job ever for a 23-year-old kid. I was uh, making $500 a week. I was painting all day long, and I was jumping in the ocean for lunch. It was great. Uh, one of the jobs I was uh, doing was to do reproductions. So all day long, every day, I did a Picasso, a Chagall, Marie Laurencin, a, a Cassat, a Monet. And every time I did it, he would teach me how to do it. He would teach me the medium. When we did a, an Impressionist painting, we'd make the palette the day before and put it on the roof in the sun to dry out so it would have the same effect as the plain air painters. Uh, crackling medium. Some of the things we did were for very wealthy people who have real art, we make fake paintings to put up when they go out of town. So if they got robbed, they take the fake paintings. The real ones would be in the storage, in the vault. It was the best education. Again, all this guy did for a living was paint. And I said, he can do it, I can do it, right? So there's no reason why you can't. What this, these two guys had was perseverance and tenacity and, and hard work. And they never, there was no plan B. Okay, so these, this is what they were going to do, and they did it. Um, and he was well known. He wrote books on, uh, on doing forgery. Well, not, they didn't call it forgery, because he didn't try to sell them as real. They were in the style of, so if there's any lawyers out there, in the style of. And these are some of the paintings here, Birth Marisol, Matisse, 
This was for the, the bottom, um, Monet was for the Dura Beach Club, for the restaurant. This was the Van Dyke Cafe, which is no longer there, sadly. Um, I had a, we had a studio on the third floor, and um, we were just pumping painting. I was like, it was great, this was a wonderful, great time. And that's when Lincoln Road, 1994, Lincoln Road started to take off after the Van Dyke Cafe was bought. The guys were owning this cafe, Mark Soiker. Well, eventually, Jack moved back to Paris, and I started my own business. And I did exactly what he was doing. It was uh, not the same, because I, I didn't just show up for work and be told what to paint. And, you know, working for Jack wasn't the greatest thing. He wasn't the nicest person. He's like, Davita, what are you doing? And, you know, he'd always make fun of me. But, you know, I had a great education. When he left, I had a hustle. And that's one of the things students nowadays don't understand. You got to push, you got to sell, you got to motivate yourself to get out there and be, you know, ex excited about what you do. That's another thing. The sad artist. Well, is me doesn't work because what we sell is very exciting. I think if you're an artist, you're selling somewhat of entertainment, visual pleasure, but it's an exciting thing, and you have to be exuberant about what you do. So here's a painting of um, Caravaggio, one of my favorite painters, um, uh, and I had a great client. <coughs> Excuse me, this great client is doing every year commissioning to do a Caravaggio, another painting. I did murals. This is a mural for Miami Children's Hospital. There's me there. This is the. This is an interesting story. This is St. Patrick's Church in Miami Beach. This is my first time I ever was commissioned to do a pedicure on a mural. I went to do the mural, and they it was. Um, they had all these natives with these long claws at the bottom of their feet. It was done like in the you know twenties. So they asked me to repair the mural, and I said, "Okay, the only reason, the way I'll do it is if I can give a pedicure. I cannot allow because there's young kids there to think that these natives were so savage that they would have claws." And the, the priest said, "Yeah, go ahead." So I actually went and I painted out all the claws because it was so horrible. But it wasn't a restoration because I was really given free reign. There was nothing to work off of, so I was just giving free reign to fix it. But it was a, it was a nice mural. This mural it was my best job when I was young. Uh, it was the owners of Progressive Insurance, and they're in Coconut Grove. They have a house in the Moorings. And um, I got to do their ceiling. And I was like, okay, I could do it, you know. Michelangelo did it, I could do it. Man, my neck killed me. I was painting like, oh. It was horrible. Um, it was a great job because they, they filmed me and they kind of liked the idea of an artist. And that's another thing we don't think about as artists is that people love to have artists around. So live art, I know, I think I just saw my student John. John, John does live art all the time, very popular, great artist. Um, people love to see the magic of art. I mean, you ever see the people painting plain air outside, painting the beach, and everybody surrounds them? They want to see the magic. So it's something we don't think about. Here's another Caravaggio. Lawrence Amatadima. I love this. So Lawrence Amatadima. And these are some of the artists that I'm impressed about. So those first two guys really influenced me to become an artist because they can do it, I can do it. All right, that's my motive. There's no reason why they can. I can't do it if they could. So here's Velasquez. I really like Velasquez because see, the people he used in his paintings weren't idealized. They're like real people in the classical settings. And I thought that's like what I want to do in my art. I want to put some real people in there and put them in classical poses. I mean, even though it's contemporary themes, I thought it would be more interesting. And Rubens. In March, I'm taking students who are going to um, some students from Broward, some students from the Art Institute, some people from outside, we're going to Paris, we're going to Duluth, and um, we're going to the Rubens Room, where I will cry. Every time we go away, I cry. Teach it. The students laugh at me, I don't care. But I can't wait to go to the Rubens Room. I love Rubens because of his form with color, right? Under form is how we describe an object and value, but he uses color to describe objects, which I think is very beautiful. And who doesn't like Rembrandt, right? I had some students in art appreciation at Broward. I said, uh, what do you guys think of Rembrandt? And the kid said, you mean the toothpaste, right? And I was like, 
we got to go back and start over. Right? But what I like about Rembrandt, I think everybody loves about Rembrandt, is the glow the paintings give. If, if you've seen a Rembrandt up close, they glow because of the way it's painted. The, the lights are very opaque, very thick. The darks are very thin and absorb the light. So you have this real feeling of glowing. And it's, he really revolutionized the way of painting because the whole surface is not even like you would typically see in a, in a, like a, a classical painting. And I, I love the psychological feel of his paintings. I mean, you, you just look at this self-portrait and you can feel the despair. Now, oddly enough, I, I love Rauschenberg. When I tell people I like Rauschenberg, basically, it's contrary to what you do. It's, that's so far out there. It's more conceptual. Um, but what I like about his work is the overlays. What's interesting is that the, Ren you know, the Renaissance person sees in, in, in their whole lifetime the amount of images we well, excuse me, the Renaissance person saw in their lifetime the amount of images we see in a day. The amount of images that we process in a day is, is more than they saw in a lifetime. So you can imagine uh, how our eyes have changed, how we process images. So why not the art? Shouldn't the art reflect that? Jasper Johns. Everybody knows Jasper Johns? Crickets. 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 Okay, you should know Jasper Johns. And here we are with Chuck Close again. I rather like Chuck Close as the reinvention of the, of the portrait. Now, his original paintings, if you're familiar with Chuck Close, were highly um, photoreal. That's what he was known for. That's what we got um, known for. And he did painting of figures when nobody painted number one. Number two, no one would even dare do figures. And number three, you have to be an idiot to do portraits. And that, he said, he, this is a, his, his quote, by the way, he thought, well, that gives me a lot of room. If, if nobody's doing it, I'm going to do it. He wasn't intimidated by that. That's what got him known. After he had his spinal collapse, <clears throat> his painting had to change because he couldn't lift his arms and couldn't spray anymore. He had literally paints with two hands like this and that grid system. I would argue that his paintings are more beautiful now. They're the mosaics, I think they're much more sensuous, and um, they're not just merely a transcription of paint, in, um, you know, from a picture of the paint. <coughs> Another artist I really, really, really like is Neo Expressionist Sally, who uses, he's, he kind of borrows from Jasper Johns, he's using multiple images, which I love, the idea of reading the same objects, on, on all different objects on the same plane. Um, he combines canvases together, he'll take two paintings and bring them to one who'll cut a hole in a canvas and put a painting in there. He'll put objects in there, I love that, uh, that, that vocabulary that he has. Um, he's not a really great craftsman in painting, he's not the best as drawing goes, but I just love his concepts. He quotes once in a while, he'll quote from our history, the pictures of being there, the faces down there. But when you look at his paintings, and you see the dissolving images, it takes a while. And that's another thing I like about painting. Um, I think painting should be uh, not like media, in the sense that we don't read it in 10 seconds. I think a painting should be something that kind of unfolds in front of you. The more you look at it, the more you learn. Or, you know, the next time you come see it, you have another effect. It shouldn't be obvious all the time. It should be ambiguous. I think paintings should be um, more poetic. And, um, and, you know, just a visual experience. Anybody ever heard of Odd Nerdrum? Cricket? I don't know. These are artists you guys should write down because he's a great artist. These, these are artists that are alive today, I mean, at least Sally and Odd Nerger, but Jasper Johns are. Um, Odd Nerger right now is in jail, but that's a, beside that point. He's a, a figurative painter who's obviously walking in the path of Rembrandt. Very psychological imagery, very thick paint, very, uh, very uh, tactile experience of seeing his paintings. And Dan Christensen, the guy who did the circles, told me that uh, if you want to see a, a figure of painting, you're going to love, let's go to this gallery. So it's at Edward Thorpe Gallery, which is cool. It was right above a post office down in, in Soho. And I walked into this gallery, and I saw these paintings. Um, 
And then I knew I was onto something. I said, okay, I like figure painting in the time when no one's doing it. But now look at this. Now, if you guys ever saw the movie The Cell, they have a scene that took a copy of this from this. Um, but it, it's, it's old and new. It looks like an old painting, but the idea, the con concept is very contemporary. The repetitive images of the figure, you know, the clouds being repeated, you know, very surreal, um, very psychological, very apocalyptic. That would look nice in the house, wouldn't it? Every morning you wake up. <laughs> Just love these paintings. I love, and if you see them up close, they're, they're, they're not clean paintings in the sense that they're, like there's a soft touch. They're very aggressive. He scrapes them. He takes sandpaper to them. And so you see all that residue. You see the process in the painting. You see his footprint, so to speak, of where he went around the painting. And it's very, for me, what a great experience to see that human interaction between the art, the viewer, and the artist. If you like figurative work, this is the guy you should write down. <coughs> and Jimmy Seville, anybody know Jimmy Seville? One, crickets, two, three. All right, Jimmy Seville. Jimmy Seville had a great show at the Norton about two years ago. Um, her paintings are huge. I'm going to show you the scale of a person. Um, she paints in like a very expressive, abstract expression of style, but using the figure. So when you see the paintings up close, if you cut out a square, it's like an abstract expressionist painting. Look at the size of those paintings here. I wouldn't be able to get it in my studio. It's too big. And Hung Lu is another artist, if you guys... Anybody know Hung Lu? All right, write, write these down, okay? Hung Lu, I'll tell you the experience of Hung Lu. I went to a lawyer in the Miami Center down in, uh, in downtown, and I'm, I get off, I don't know if this ever happened to you as art lovers, but I get off the elevator and I turn and I see a painting. I'll show you the painting in a sec. And um, I don't know, before I knew it, I was in front of the painting. It just called me, like, I don't, there could be the world falling apart, and I had to go to the painting. And I look at this painting, and I'm like, oh my God, it's, just, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful, this something about it that called me, you know. So then I went to the lawyer and I said, Which, you know, whose painting is that? He goes, I just bought it for Bernice Steinbaum Gallery. It's like, oh my God. One, I'm like, why didn't you buy my work, you know? But two, I was like, you have to hook me up, I have to meet her. I had a chance to meet her with some students that I had taken to Wynwood, and uh, of course, I just went into the office and hugged her and pretended like I knew her and she didn't know me. She was a really nice person. I was like a little schoolgirl. This is a painting. It's a bad image. It's a lot more colorful. He says her, <coughs> her drip, she uses a lot of linseed oil to paint drip, and she says her drips are both unifying and dissolving. So they, they both bring the painting together, but also disintegrate the images. So the images are kind of there and not there. And I think that's, uh, that's just beautiful. I love the birds and, you know, What's, what's cool about these paintings, and, and what I like about paintings like this, is that you don't actually try to understand it, right? You don't try to say, hey, okay, why is the bird there? Why is the, the child there? I need to know. Or you kind of just take it as an image and you enjoy it, right? You don't try to break it apart into its little parts. She does a lot of overlays of shapes, colors. She's from China, and she took all these old photos back when she came here and, and made paintings of these unknown people. So the real reason I'm here is to talk to you about process and, and how, how I make paintings. Is there any painters here? So I don't know. John, Lisa, John, Kathleen. Okay, cool. Um, maybe this will help you, or maybe um, you already know some of this stuff here. Again, one of the things I, uh, I talk about with my students, and I told my students they're going to be a little bored going to go over some stuff I always go over, is this wonderful relationship we have with, with the art. Um, you know, we work on our painting, we act on our paintings, we change our paintings, but in the same time, the art is acting on us. And there's a beautiful symbiotic relationship between the artist and the art. And that's why real artists always make different art. 
you know, there's, imagine an artist that makes the same art all the time. Then he prints it on coffee mugs and tote bags. You know that artist, right? That's not an artist, because they're, they're just not related to the work. Because as you make the work, it kind of it changes you, and, and it just by that nature alone, you're going to be a different person. So if we keep that in mind every time we make art, it's a beautiful experience. It's not just making a product. That's separation for us, for me, at least I think we craft. Again, the, what I love about just making art itself is the transformative nature of the materials. We have these raw materials, whether it's clay or, you know, paint is just dirt and oil, right? It's nothing more. We smear it on a piece of fabric. And we give it to an artist, and the artist manipulates that, intervenes with that, that material, and makes art. And then the art itself is hung and displayed and creates feeling and makes people think. I think it's kind of beautiful that we go from raw material, dirt and oil, clay, whatever, marble, and we make people feel by just the intervention of the artist. There's a special role for artists, men, right? It's something very spiritual. Well, that's... That line should be in the middle, right? Anyway, general, when I also would talk about uh, in painting, one of the first things I talk about is that, okay, to be a good painter, you have to draw, all right? There's no way around it. Most people can't draw but love to paint, or they don't want to draw because it's work, because drawing seems to be more work than painting. But when we paint, we have to think about drawing. It's the foundation of what we do, okay? Even the movement, the eye-hand coordination that you learn from drawing is going to find itself into the painting. Most of all paintings I do, I'll do a drawing of it. Not everything, but at least the figure. So the thing when we think about in, in drawing, most importantly, is the general form first over the specific form, right? Um, which sounds obvious. It's obvious to my five-year-old. When I tell him to draw an apple tree, he'll draw the shape of the tree and put apples there. But when I go to Broward and I tell the student to draw the figure, they'll draw the eyeball first. And I'm like, where's the body? Uh, I'm mean, just going to fall off the page, you know, you've got to plan it out. You've got to work with the general form first. The great analogy I have is to think like a sculptor when you paint, when you're drawing. Think of a general shape, a lump of clay, and then make the details. So when we go to painting process, and we already have a drawing down pat, right? When we go to painting process, we always have to think that form and value, form and value is, describes form, over color. Color is secondary to form. It has to look like the person more than it has to be the color of the person, right? So we have to make sure that our form is first. And we're going to see that direct and indirect painting is going to divide some of those, and you're going to have a process that's just form and just value later. That's the form and the color later. <coughs> All right. Direct painting is you look at the object and you paint it as you see it. Direct visual perception. Indirect painting is you do a process. And the process for indirect painting would be grisaille, which is grayscale, I'll show you an example, and verdaccio, which is green, kind of a green grisaille, and uh, the rub-off method, the stray method, which you'll put pigment and rub off. That's the favorite of most students because that's quick. They love quick results, right? They're so used to the computer giving them quick results. Um, another uh, direct way with painting would be a la prima. If you guys ever heard of a la prima, it's a very quick style. You don't even draw, you paint. You draw very quickly. This here would be a la prima. It's quick, you see a lot of brush stroke. You can, um, a lot of people like a la prima. It's very expressive because of the, um, you, know, you can see where the artist was. Right? A lot of classical painters, what they'll do, which I don't like, is they'll come back and blend out their brush strokes. They'll kind of hide their footprints in the sand so you don't know where they were. I don't understand why they would do that. There's something very human about the brush stroke. You can see the expressiveness. There's a lot of feeling inherent in the brush stroke. All right, here's a painting that was done more or less in Ala Prima, quick, very uh, you know, expressive brush stroke, very painterly. And here would be direct painting. Well, then direct painting could be from a model or it could be from a photo, but it's directly perceived, visually perceived. Um, this painting obviously was not from models. This is from a photo because my kid would not stand still for that long. These are my two boys. Here 
Here's an example of Grisai. This painting here, I'm gonna go through, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna go through the process of this painting with you from the drawing to the painting. I have some pictures for you to just show you. Um, but here's going from a Grisai. In this case, the Grisai is not painted. It's actually vine charcoal that's been sprayed. It was drawn directly on the canvas and then painted. And here is a painting with Grisai and then the glazing. Now the glazing is a very thin layer of paint. Students get confused, they think it's going to be like a special frosting material. No, it's just thin paint. There's two ways to do it, wet into wet, or uh, dry on, uh, wet on dry. When you take the paint and you really push the paint to reveal the undertone. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the face here is not done in Versailles. So I, what I do, I take all these methods and I put them in a blender. And that's what I use. I use whatever I need at the time. The fabric for me was going to be easier if I did it, I did it in Grisai. All right, so this painting here is, is Verdaccio. And Verdaccio is only black paint and Mars, titanium, or zinc, white, and a yellow, some sort of yellow. Yellow ochre is fine. And that creates a greenish tone to it. And it really comes from the old paintings of the Gothic period, which were green underpaintings that were, were the shadows of green. It works well with the flesh. This painting, too, if you look at the scarlet ibises, they're not done in, in Verdaccio. They're direct painting. So I wanted the figure to have that resonance. What, what indirect painting does, like Versailles and Verdaccio, is it allows the light to go through these beautiful layers of paint and bounce back out. And it tends to glow more than direct painting. Now, that's what's beautiful about oil paint that I don't like about acrylic. Acrylic will dry through evaporation, where oil will dry through oxidation. So what happens is the oil never leaves the paint. So the pigments stay here, and the space between the pigments is oil, light can pass through to the underpaint. Where in acrylic, as soon as the water dries, it shrinks, that's why it gets darker. And when it shrinks, it doesn't allow the light to get through unless it's done with a retarder. So yeah, the, the resonance, the luminosity of these paintings typically can't be achieved with acrylic. That's why I like oil. And oil dries fast. People say, oh, it doesn't dry. I get it to dry the next day. I use the right materials. So drawing is the key. Drawing brings us to a deeper, more experienced relationship in relation to the object. Uh, my wife on the left. And this is Dan. I don't know if you know Dan, the model. I don't know if it comes up here. <coughs> Excuse me again. So here's a, um, a painting I'm starting. Oh, I started, um, so I started with the drawing. And not only the time does the drawing look like the painting, because the more I draw, the more I understand the form, I understand the person. I start to learn the nuances of the person as I go. Um, and you can see here that, um, you know, I don't take shortcuts. I, I love process, so for me the process is the fun part. I'm not trying to get the painting out of the way. So that's, usually students just want to get the painting done real quick. Drawing to the underpainting to the final painting. This is called Red Lion Fish. There's another this is a drawing on tracing paper that I did one day in class of a student. I really loved his face. Sometimes I look at somebody and I'm like, oh, that'd be, you'd make a good painting, you know? Um, whether it's the inner spirit or the outer image of the person. So if I didn't ask you to do a painting yet, don't insult him. Okay? The drawing here, this gentleman is here, by the way. You may notice him and then drawing to the painting. <coughs> I love putting them side by side because I get to see there's some nuances that are different, all the eye I can fix it and stuff. But you know, as you do it, you'll be learning more and more. And I have students who just want to jump right into painting and they you know they don't they want to skip all the drawing part and then they complain later that they don't they try to fix the painting with you know they, they want to fix the drawing part of the painting with paint. And that's where they get into trouble. Here's a painting I did. Um, this, this painting I like, it, it means a lot to me. Um, this, I really like this painting. 
this, so here's the painting I did. It's on tracing paper. Obviously, I, I, I didn't really care about the drawing so much. I just roughed it in with a fine charcoal to get the idea of what I wanted to do. Kind of come up with a face. I wanted to do a face that was nobody's face, kind of like a Renaissance face. And then I transferred it, and the projector doesn't show it, but it transferred it to the canvas, and then I continued fleshing out some of my ideas. And it's okay to kind of let the painting evolve. Again, if you understand that the painting is going to change you, it acts on you, that's even more beautiful. I think it would be really boring to say, this is what I'm going to start with, and this is what I'm going to end with. I know how it's going to look. Like the photorealists, I don't get. Because they know exactly what the painting is going to look like in the end. I don't know. To me, that's beautiful. It's a great experience. So here, as soon as I did the vine charcoal, I sprayed it and I coated it with acrylic to seal the vine charcoal, and then I paint oil on top. You can paint oil on acrylic, but not vice versa. All right, so here I have, uh, I'm blocking in the top. I did the verdaccio of the skin, and I did the grisaille's direct painting. And this is a little close up of the hand. I wasn't happy with the hand, so I had to change the hand. Not a fun thing to do with paint, but um, you know, and then you have to do it. If it doesn't look right, you got to make it work. <coughs> Along with changing the form, I changed the concept. Originally, I was going to have this hawk, this um, alligator come in, and then I thought it was like the lady of the Everglades. Oh my God, it's going to be boring. Hell, <laughs> right? Yeah, it was, it's, it's so tacky. Um, so I got rid of it. I, I canned the uh, alligator, put it through. That was a great move. But uh, we'll see. And I changed the background. I'm adding more details. If you notice, the turtle is done kind of a grayish tone, kind of like a grisaille. And I came back and I glazed the colors in later. I want to get that form down first. The colors are secondary. I can always put the color in. I got to make sure that the lighting is right, and the lighting and the value is right. And the change here is the water reflection, with the water, the meniscus, so the water coming up to the, the lilies. I also, I'm going to go back, if you see the, I have a picture of that, but the, I had a friend tell me that the, the legs of the ibises were really low and it didn't look good, so I had to pick them up. And when I picked them up, I thought it would be really cool if it was kind of like holding a cape or something, but then it was like too ridiculous. So I had a stick. And the stick is like the crucifix. And it's a little, <coughs> All right, so here's another painting called The Conjurers. Um, after I did that painting, I felt rigid. I said, I gotta loosen up a little bit, you know? So I just started drawing on the canvas, which is really daring for me because I'm such a control freak. So, but I did it with vine charcoal and a brush. So I did my drawing and <coughs> I found it was quite easy to blend with vine charcoal. But if you sneeze, you pull drawing one away. So I had to be very careful. So this is the, the drawing done. Um, kind of blended out and I sprayed the heck out of it with fixative and coated it with acrylic so I know I can seal it and I don't have to worry about painting on it. And then I went ahead to just painting a light of the figure. No idea what the painting was going to be. Again, it's, I just love the journey of making the painting. Um, and eventually I had, I censored out, I mean, I carefully put in birds in the right areas to finish that painting. Now here's another painting called Gaia, the Earth Mother. This is kind of a big painting. Um, and what I did here is I did all the drawings in my sketchbook, like this big, and then I just blew them up, and I pieced them together. So I took some of them, I put them in Photoshop. I don't know if you guys use Photoshop in your paintings, but it's, it's a tool, you know, I'm sure. Da Vinci would do it. All right, so I scanned in my, my drawing up of just the fabric, and I did a drawing of the head this big, the fabric is this big, I put it in Photoshop, I kind of scaled it together and blew it up bigger and then transfer that drawing to the, to the canvas. So in, in the beginning, there's going to be a child in her arms that changes out. And if you notice, the fabric is going to change too, because I thought it was too clunky. There's my wife's hand as the model for the... So I mean, I always take reference photos, you know, and you got to make sure that the lighting's on. So on the, on the left, you see I changed the fabric out and revealed the red center, which I thought worked better. That's what I, that's what I wear when I paint. 
And then I got to put all these toys in there. I mean, who gets to paint toys like that? How much fun with that? You know, so finish painting. And they, for me, the concept was, you know, this is the Earth Mother. Um, and like we're, you know, we're kids, you know, we're like our kids. And all we want to do is get off this planet and explore other planets. So we have like these 50s rockets to get out of here, you know. I thought that was kind of fun. And the bird that was supposed to be in the nest is really a wind-up bird, if you see close. All right, here's another painting I did leave in the swan. Again, I did the drawing first. If the drawing doesn't work, if I don't feel it, I just don't do the painting. I want to do the painting. So I did the drawing, and then I started the painting. And on this side here, you can see that I'm, I'm you can't really see, but up there is a swan on top of her head that I'm trying to figure out. The paint is not dry. You can notice that the tracing paper is sticking to it. And I was able to rectify that. And here's the two paintings together. One really small, one really big. The pediment on top I did, I, I made a triangle shape and I stretched it and it, it's a UFO with stingrays. So it was really cool because it kind of mimicked the invert triangle, invert triangle of her, of her headpiece. But your story. Well, a lot of times I put these paintings up and I get people who don't like art, they'll say, what does it mean? Right? Like this painting. And they do have meaning. I don't always want to reveal the meaning because I think it takes away from the visual experience. But here, I'll tell you this one. This was a, a friend of mine who uh, was a really sweet guy, but then all of a sudden he was a mean guy. He's one of those people. Uh, really, like, he was loving and then just fly off the handle. So I wanted to capture that personality in one, in one, in one painting. So I did the dual portrait. I was doing a couple of these portraits. And um, he had the, the UFO shirt on, and that was cool. It worked. And, um, but I had that space, I needed an overlay to kind of tie it together. And it was during Halloween, and every Halloween I carved apples with my, my kids. And we let them rot and make shrunken heads. So while I'm carving the apple, I'm thinking, that's it, you know. I'm going to take a picture of the apple, and then I'm going to carve it, take a picture and carve it, and then I'm going to make the UFO, I'm going to make my student the alien. And it's going to have order, and then it's going to be chaos, and it's going to be order again. So through chaos, we can get order again. And I thought that kind of tied the painting together. Here's a painter friend of mine from Haiti, and she paints with bleach on black fabric. So I wanted to catch her working. So she always wears a respirator because of the bleach. So I have her in pose, I have her working. <coughs> and um, in, the, in the end of the painting, one thing I missed was her beautiful smile. She had like, one of those people have that amazing smile that's bright. And um, well, again, I really didn't know what to do. I was watching the movie Help with the Beatles. And it was a scene where they had a wind up shattering teeth that eat the grass. And I was like, oh, that's it. And I thought it was right. I told my wife, you know, what do you think? It's crazy. And she's like, no, that's great. So I did it. Nobody knows what it means. It's very ambiguous. There's an inferred narrative there. But when people know her, they're like, oh, I get it. I understand why you did it. So if you're doing work that's very personal, obviously it's a personal piece. I mean, um, it's OK to, to build your narrative as you see fit. Here's um, a painting. Uh, this, this guy had the misfortune of leaving his camera in my house. And like any good person, I had to go through all the photos and try to see if I can get some blackmail. And uh, there he was, he had some selfies. So he really likes birds. He's like an ornithologist, an amateur ornithologist. So I, um, I made a painting. I didn't tell him, I just did the whole painting for him. You know? So it's, it's him looking at us with the birds intertwined in his, in his head. He wears the beard because he's from Canadian, and during hockey season, they don't shave. So that was going to be kind of fun, too. All right. So that was process. I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about artists and career. Um, what do I do? Well, you know, if you want to paint your own paintings and live off it, it's going to be very hard. I mean, there's no lie there, right? I think anybody who thinks it's easy is crazy. And again, if it was easy, everybody would do it. It's the best job in the world. But you can do it. <coughs> Dying. You can do it if you have a plan. Okay? You know you can do it. Um, one thing you have to do is diversify your talents. All right? So if you're a good drawer, and also be a good painter, good printmaker, good sculptor. 
have, this is a key, have multiple streams of revenue. All right, you have to have, you can't just wait at home for someone to knock on the door and tell you, I want to buy all your paintings. All right, this is just unreasonable. So you have to have your fine art, maybe your illustration, maybe you teach, maybe you do some graphic, graphic work, which is, is always graphic work out there if you need it. And don't forget, as an artist who knows graphics, you have probably get the job fast because they know that you know art, and you have an artistic sensibility. <coughs> you have to be marketable, and this is like a bad thing in the art world because it's like compromise. But you have to be true to yourself as an artist and also be marketable. So think about the audience for your work. There's always an audience for something that you're doing. If you like it, someone else does, right? Never give up. Nothing makes me sadder when I hear students who graduated later on and like, yeah, no, I never did that anymore. It kills me. I, <laughs> before um, I go forward, you know, one of the things, I don't know if I was just really, really, really stubborn, like really, really, really stupid, but there, nobody was going to tell me I couldn't do it. And my whole family told me I couldn't do it. I mean, I don't know why, but if you really believe you can do it, it just falls into place. But you have to have a plan, you have to be smart. All right, so some of the things you can do is murals. I'll show you some murals I've done. Portraits, animals. Fine art, design, illustrated graphics. <coughs> Excuse me. I've done demonstrative evidence for court. I make graphic accident reconstructions. Good stuff, right? Teaching, illustration, renderings. I've done patent drawings. They're a lot of fun when you wake up. Renderings. I just recently done a rendering for a interior designer. All right, here, this is for the Florida Department of Agriculture. This is actually right across from Central Campus. I did this with students. Um, there we are over there. Because exterior murals are, are you know, a great way to make a, a living. I can't do it anymore because I'm old. And it's just it's too much. It's too taxing. taxing. Here is ArtServe. I don't know if you guys remember this mural on the side of ArtServe. <coughs> this was a funny mural because the guy who... All the students had to submit a great idea. And we had amazing ideas. And as one student comes in, he's like, This is the view my file corrupted. I said, I don't care, you gotta give me something to show them. And it was all inverted colors. It was green and red. I said, just I want to throw a lot of work at them so they can see it. Which one did they pick? The bad one. And they <laughs> that's the one they picked with the green and the yellow. And they I don't know why. And I was like, oh great, because I told them the student was working on it for hours. And the student's like, what? Just the way it is sometimes. The one you think they won't pick. That was a big mural. It was uh, on the side of the building. They had recently paint, painted over it. Here's the mural I did in the airport for Embraer Airline. There's me in one of those lifts. That's not fun. You know, it's good when you're young, but I, I'm, I'm done. Here's one for school. And of course, as you guys progress in your business, you hire people to help you so you don't have to get up on the toll ladder. You art direct. Here's one I did uh, with, uh, students didn't work on this, but they were working on other murals at the time. <coughs> Here's an interesting one. This is a um, tile for a stove. Look at the size of their stove. If you look over in the left, that's my table. So their, their stove is used a very wealthy family, and they wanted these special tiles. So I had to do it with porcelain paint so it wouldn't burn. And you can do portraits. This guy, after I did this portrait, he got fired. And then the, <laughs> see the, that's true. And then the president that came in after him, everybody hated, so everybody asked me to do the portrait. They thought it was like the bad luck. So don't, I don't know, I hope it's not bad luck. He got fired right after that. Yes. Portrait. And John. My son thought the painting was him, so I gave him a beer. It's my little boy. In screens, I used to do a lot of screens. These are like room dividers. 
Um, you can go, I used to go to like, you know, there was no internet when I was trying to sell my art, which is good. It was really good because I was the only artist they did. Now today, today they can say, you know, they'll Google 100 artists in the area. But when you know an artist, if someone says, do you know any artist? Yeah, I know this guy Tom. So it was really good for me. I think the internet is kind of a hindrance. But anyway, I would go from restaurant to restaurant with my book, and I would start talking to them. And one of the things I could sell at restaurant was screens that I could paint on one side with full finishing on the other. I can block, I can make up some story that this is really ugly. This will go to decor. So I did a lot of those. <clears throat> and here, lastly, there's the um, do, doing work in, in the airport, public art. You, know, you can try to do some public art. That was kind of nice. I, it was a nice experience. All right, in conclusion. Drawing is key to painting, right? I grab the dead. General form over specific form. Don't ever forget that. Say real quick. The true artist is more concerned with the process than the product, right? Don't try to rush the painting. Enjoy it. Rejection is part of our commission-based industry. You guys know what that means? Let's just imagine that you put all your eggs into the basket of getting into a gallery. So what you have to do, a lot of times they make you pay, which drives me crazy. I, that chapter in my life I closed down. I no longer pay. If they want me to be in the show, I'll be in the show. Because there's a whole industry racket trying to get money out of artists, making them pay for all these shows. <coughs> so, uh, your permission base means you go to a gallery, you pay them, can you look at my work? So we have to pay to audition with the hopes of maybe getting in. Then maybe we'll get in. So then they say, okay, now can you show me your work? Can you, can you put me on the wall with the hopes of selling? And in the end, all down the line is, what do we really want? What do you really want? You want to sell your work, right? But you have to go through all these hoops in this industry. Me, I find my own clients. It's not easy, but it's, it's just, for me, it's the only way it works. All right, don't wait for inspiration. I had a lot of students, you know, they get hung on, I don't know what to do anymore. You know, I'll tell you one thing not to do, is look at a lot of art on the internet. Dan Christensen, I, I used to be so eager, did you see the show, did you see that show? And he goes, Ugh. I just care about my own work. Because, you know, sometimes when you look at work all the time, you guys do it all the time. Already all the time. Right? All the time. And what happens is you start to, like, exhaust your visual energy. You know, after a while, you don't want to look at anything. It's like, ah, what am I going to do that's fresh? I saw everything. Don't look so much. Look at, go to galleries and see real art. Don't look at the reproductions. All right, so explore all modes of art making. Um, oh, here's a very great thing. Um, I'm, what's my voice? I, I want to find myself in art. I'm going to tell you what to do. It's the best thing. Pick your three favorite artists and copy the heck out of them. You'll never do good, but you'll find yourself on the other side. And that was advice I got from a teacher, and it worked for me. Just try, what do you like about that artist? I'm going to do that. And I'm going to try to copy the way he paints. I'm going to try to do all that at the same time. And somehow you're going to find yourself at the end, your own voice. All right, so be the best in your field. Stay creative. Creativity is so important. One of the biggest problems I have is students are not creative. They're good. They know the program. They know how to paint. But they don't want to take their, there's this fear factor that people will see them. They'll, they'll be vulnerable for a minute or two if they're creative. <laughs> And again, surround yourself with a support system of people who like art. There's nothing worse than being an artist surrounded by people who are not. My father is a construction worker, my brother is a corporate guy from New York. You know, they don't talk about art. I can't talk to them, I can't share. They'll never understand me, like people who love art. That's why I connect a lot with my students. Because when I see my students, I, I see my friends. Because I know they understand where I'm coming from. Go to all the exhibit, exhibitions. Get your work out there. Like if you don't have a website or a blog or something, you're crazy. You gotta get your work out there. Forget about the trade, the watermark, you're gonna steal my work. Let them steal your work, you get a lawyer, right? 
If they want to be worked out, then I'll print it out. Print all the shirts out. And I'll grab my lawyer. And, all right. and don't forget when you're famous. Don't forget. All right. All right any, any questions, anybody? Yes. Yellow coat? Yeah. That's just an Oprah acrylic. And Very watered down. It's a reflective. Oh, the, the glaze? Really Alright, I'll tell you the process. The, the one that changes the light, like, there was like three different kinds of things to do. Radaccio, Versailles? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, old Versailles is a grayscale. It's like using Payne's gray and white. Yeah, in that case, you have to just draw with paint because you already have a layer of paint there, and you can't. I mean, you can, but it's not good to put lead on top of the paint. But I'll tell you real quick. I don't know if I answered your question, but I take the drawing. Yeah, I'll tell you. I take the drawing onto the however I get it onto the canvas, whether I transfer or draw directly. Then I spray it or fix it just so it doesn't move. Then I coat it with acrylic. Very thin, so I can still see the drawing not too thick. I usually use a contrasting color. So if I'm doing like a, a cool water scene, I'll do like a warm underpainting in Primatura. In this case, I was using a cool skin Versailles or Radaccio in that painting. So I did a warm background. So I usually like yellow ochre. Once I have that, then I painted with the black. For the painting with the, the ibis, it was um, black, yellow, and white creating a greenish tone as the Radaccio method. Once I made the form and, and I got the construction of the face, it looks like sculpture more than anything. Then I come in with very thin layers of color. It's like colorizing a black and white photo. And that allows the light to go through the paint to hit the white and bounce back and where it gets dark and absorbs in. Is that good? Uh, yeah. Ah, cool. Anybody else? Can you tell us what specifically you were, you're going to do in the workshop tomorrow? Tomorrow I'm going to have, my wife is going to be the model. So whatever I said here, please don't tell her. Right? It's, uh, it's going to be portrait. And we're going to do, it's going to be quick, so it has to be a la prima. So what we're going to do is basically paint directly on the canvas. So I'll uh, probably do the b straight method first to give you this, because that helps a lot of people transition from drawing to painting. I think you have more drawing classes here than that. You don't have any painting here. So you'll, we'll transition from that. It'll be nice. It'll be a nice touch. I'll have, um, I paint with a lot of Q-tips. You'll see a lot of Q-tips in that method. Right. Who's coming tomorrow? Raise your hand. Right. Question. Yes, sir. So you said that you referenced Caravaggio and Velasquez when as influences of yours, and I was sort of expecting to see that Baroque tenebrism and the collapsing of, of your, your you know, distance of the values. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is it about those two artists that you feel has gone over into your work? I like, the, I love Caravaggio because of the drama. I just love the drama. Some of the paintings I have don't have as much chiaroscuro as you would see in Caravaggio's painting, but I'm not copying Caravaggio's. You know? I mean, I'm not copying Velasquez. I'm inspired by their art, and then I make my own art. Um, I mean, I think like Odd Nerger really looked at Rembrandt and then made his own paintings, and they don't look like Rembrandt's. But um, I, I mean, if any painter, I mean, I, I look, when I get, you know that one artist you have to look at to get you going again? That would be Odd Nerger. So, I mean, as, as far as me, as far as the space in the back, I mean, I'm inspired by their work, but I'm not trying to make their work, you know? Anybody else? All right. How long does it usually take you to make a painting on average? The John painting, I, I, if I'm correct, it was two days. The, 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 John, the painting of John. Um, I did the head first and then the beard in one day. <laughs> and there's a, it depends, really, because then the other painting, it took longer. Um, the painting, 
I don't know if I liked the painting so much I took my time with it, but the, uh, the Moonlight Path, the girl to red irises, uh, the scarlet irises, that took longer. It took maybe two months. Two months, like okay, right? Anybody else? Yes, sir. In The Conjurers, I'm curious about your thought process about why you decided to cover her up. <coughs> no, we, um, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you exactly why. This is the truth. While I was doing the painting, I, had no, I don't care about that. I mean, I don't think anybody does. But while I was doing the painting, I, I have a commune. I'm at Studio 18, and there's 19 artists there. And just hearing, you know, like you, you, you pick up the feedback from people, and a lot of people, all they would talk about is the area of interest. And I don't want that to be the painting. I didn't really think that was important. So for me, it was a, yes, it was two nudes, and, and they were, they're like evil twins conjuring up the storm. Um, it's kind of a dark painting. So, but I didn't, I didn't want it to be about that. And I guess because of the angles, were, you know. So I just kind of made it a secondary notion. You know, it's the imagination. Yes? You talk about that instant retinal impact that they, yeah, I mean, Clinic Greenberg, you know, that type of work is totally non objective. Um, it has nothing to do with uh, figure, but I, I just like the impact of color. And I was like, you know, even though I'm doing figures, I, I think color should be important. Um, a lot of some painters, a lot of figure painters that I know are friends of mine who they really reduce their, their saturation and their color. Um, but I just love the impact of color. Or for me, yeah, I just like to see it. I do a lot of paintings that I want to look at because typically they're going to be in my studio. So I, I don't think about the viewer, like what they're going to like as much as what I like. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just commenting because I'm joking what you said talking about that before, you know, walking out in the middle of the uh, uh, airport. And the original retinal impact of that painting that you saw, mm -hmm. just were drawn to it, had to go to it, was how much that influenced. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Yeah, that, that painting that I saw in the, it was in Miami Center downtown, the Hung Lu painting, um, I don't know what it was that, that, that brought me over. It was, it was colors, but it was, it was something about the painting. It was, it was the emotion of the figure. It was the this effluence of the drips. Something about it that called me over. But, um, you know, I wish my paintings had that impact. People. I'm not too sure they do, but uh, maybe one or two would have that impact. I think it's a very personal experience for everybody, you know, what you like, you know what? Yes, ma'am. Have you experienced making mistakes or failures in any way? And uh, if you have, how did you deal with it? And what would you advise students experiencing that? How to deal with it? <coughs> all right. It's a great question. Um, first off, Every artist makes bad art. We just don't see it, right? I mean, they're thrown away. So, I mean, Picasso made a lot of bad paintings. Some of them he left, and some of them he discarded. So whenever that happens, you have an off day, um, you don't have to get so hard on yourself. I used to be really, really hard on myself that if I'm such a great artist, why can't I do that? If I'm such a great artist, why is this hand look bad or the color's off? Um, I start to realize that one thing I don't do anymore is abandon the painting, which I used to do. Um, I just, I, I don't let the painting beat me in that sense. If, if it's an issue of color or just having a bad day, it could be the humidity in the room or the oil is not sticking, right? It could be anything. Um, I just approach it. There are some paintings that I like more than others. I understand that's just the nature of, of what we do, that I'm not going to love everything. Um, it's not always going to be a home run every time. But um, each one is a self-discovery, so I understand each painting has a purpose in my career. Um, but I, I continue plowing through it. I don't give up. And the students shouldn't, you know, they should try it if they have an issue. And most students will abandon it. They'll just they'll be frustrated with themselves and, and walk out. Um, but if they say, you know what, I'm not going to this painting. It's only a painting. Like we paint all, you know, it's only colored dirt and oil on a piece of fabric. Just wipe it off. It's not the end of the world. 
Yes. Some of the areas where Yes, sir. Um, with working like that, um, can, say from a commission based uh, perspective, say you're working on a painting and it doesn't come out the way the client wants or that you want, how would you do that? All right, well, first off, if you have a commission, then that's paramount to any decision you make of the band that you cannot abandon because you have a commission. So what I would do, uh, again, there would be no room for mistakes. If I, get, if I went to a, a, a client and I did a portrait and I took some photos and I come back at work and, I, and the paintings are coming out right, I'll just go back and take more. I said, I need a new session because I'm like getting the right light or whatever it is. But I would never, I mean, you, you, clients are too few to mess up. So that's like um, the most important thing. I mean, it's, it's making the art is the easy part. You know, being an artist, the hardest part is getting the work sold, right? So, you know, the, first of all, <coughs> I would never tell the client any of this, you know, I, just, I need to, I don't like the light or whatever. Yes, John? Somebody raise your hand? Crickets? Anybody? Yes? So in regards to getting your work out there, and you say you don't like galleries or exhibitions, what would be a good way to get work out there? Maybe via the internet or other resources that's not just going from gallery to gallery saying, hey, can I be in your gallery? All right, well, first of all, it's not that I don't like galleries. I love galleries. But there are certain galleries that you want to get into. There are the vanity galleries, the ones that you pay to get into, which are not trying to sell your work. That's your ego. You're just paying to have a painting on a wall. Um, there are galleries that their job is to make money selling. And if you're in their gallery, they're going to try to sell. But remember, they have maybe 50 artists in there. So they're not trying to sell your work every day. So let's say you sell, you know, five, ten paintings, you know, five thousand each. So it's fifty grand. And half of that goes at a gallery. It's still not salary. So you got to really think about that. If you could sell the work yourself, if you can get out there yourself, you have a, an easier chance of making a living. You know, how to get the work out there? <coughs> you have to exhibit. If you don't exhibit, you don't exist. And you have to exhibit new work. So that means, to that reasoning, you have to make new work all the time. So you have exhibits to get go out there. Um, you can't have your friends come to a show and show the same work they saw at the other show. They're going to start to think you're stale. So you constantly have to make work. You constantly have to um, exhibit your work and invite your friends to come see the work. Um, you can obviously need a website. You, know, you have to have a blog or a website. You can do Wix. It's free. You know, get a free website. <laughs> at least have somebody go to, and like if somebody calls you up, you can say, you know, here's my site, take a look at my work. And as you make work, it's very important that you catalog your work, that you have a provenance of what the work is, where it was exhibited, what's the size of it. <clears throat> because you never know, you may have a show, you may have to have all the sizes ready, you know, and all the catalog. That help? Anybody else? Once. Yes. needed. Uh, and it could be anything. It could be from something that was influenced in popular culture or something I just feel like painting. Um, and the overall meaning of the painting is there is, a lot of times there isn't any. It's an ambiguous narrative. The piecing together of the meaning is, um, is what I like about the art because my narrative is not your narrative. So when you look at the work and people say, what does it mean? I say, you know, it doesn't matter. Whatever it means to you, whatever it means. So usually the figures first, and then the elements later. <coughs> Anybody else? That help you? Yeah. Okay. Anybody? One, 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 twice. Twice. All right. Thank you very much for coming.